Hello genealogist, it's Craig and this is Just Genealogy. Now that we've sort of put citation to bed and the concept of exhaustive search to bed, and oh by the way, they're never put to bed because they're constantly on your mind as a genealogist. Have I done enough? Have I cited it properly? And then we have to get into the next piece of have I analyzed it properly? So I want to lay some groundwork for the concepts that we're going to go through in regards to element three of the genealogical proof standard, which deals with the concept of analyzing your data. I'm not going to talk about the specifics of it yet. What I want to do is to lay the groundwork so that we can move forward. At first, I thought I was going to start with uh, the fundamentals of evidence. And I decided that was a little bit too specific to start out with, but if we started out at another place, we could build on it. Now, years ago, there was a thing called the Evidence Analysis and Research Process Map that used to be sold by Genealogical Publishing Company, but this one's out of date. So where do we find a new one? Well, there is in Evidence Explained, in Evidence Explained, the very first page of Evidence Explained, even before you get to the title page, is the Evidence Analysis Process Map. So what you might want to do is pause, go get your Evidence Explained, because all you have evidence explained, right? Because I've made it clear to you over the past 130 videos, my belief that unless you own this book or its slim little predecessor evidence, that you can't be a good genealogist. So you, if you own this book, then go get it and turn to that page. So we'll know what we're talking about. Now, there is another place that you can find it. You can find it in the Genealogical Standards Manual. And the place to find it in the Genealogical Standards Manual is the last page. So living proof that the first shall be last. So we, are, we have now basically in one fell swoop, we have, maybe this would be better, in the beginning in the end. We have the evidence process map in both places. So it probably will take me two sessions to talk about the evidence process map because of the, the hardest thing to do is to understand the pieces and what the pieces mean. So the first piece that we want to deal with today is the sources, information, evidence piece. And what we're dealing with with sources, these are whatever we touch. It's a source, whether it be a Bible, whether it be an artifact, whether it be a medal, whether it be a deed, a marriage bond, a marriage license, a census. A source can be anything that you will use along your journey to establish your genealogical proof. It's not just a record. And this is why Evidence Explained is so important, because Evidence Explained teaches you how to cite everything. This is how to cite sources. Examples of how you cite sources quick starts. Quick check. I never can remember that. It's quick start. There's a quick start. This is why I can, never can remember it because there is a quick start guide and then there is quick check models. Quick check models. So the book is full of quick check models and the reasoning behind them. So the first thing you have to recognize is what a source is. Now today we're not gonna talk about evaluating sources. Today we're just gonna talk about what's a source. And that's easy. 
A source is anything you touch, anything you look at, anything you listen to. That's a source. And then you have to figure out how to cite it, but that's a source. Now, what do sources... Oh, wait, I forgot something. I didn't mention the internet, and I didn't mention websites, and that wasn't purposeful. I just don't think like that. So, this sources include websites to be found on the internet. So what do we find? What do we pull out of these sources? What's, what's our goal to pull out of these sources? Well, we want to find the second piece, and that is information. Now, most people, when they look at a record or a source, the only thing that counts for them is that which they can see, not which they can infer from the record, not which they can learn from the record, just what they can see. And that's not what records are all about, because records lead you to records that came before, records lead you to records that came after, and the information on these records can tell you something about the individual that you're researching, like whether they're a liar or not, just as an example. So what we're going to deal with is we have sources. Sources contain information. Well, if we just took all this information and put it in a book, would that be a family history? No, it wouldn't. Because information leads us to evidence. In other words, there are pieces of uh, information that relate to what we're dealing with. They relate to, they're, they're relevant to the proof that we're trying to make. So three pieces today. Think about a source, any source. It doesn't make any difference what it is. Recognize the information that can be found from that source. And then how are we going to convert that information into evidence? Those are the issues that we at, at the high level in the evidence analysis process map have to recognize. That there are sources, there is information, and there is evidence. The lack of any one of these pieces will mess you up. You can't have information without a source. You can't have evidence without information. You can have a source, but without information, you can't have evidence. That which is found on the source is not evidence. It is from that information that you create the evidence, if that makes sense to you. I mean, it may be that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the information and the evidence. But recognize that information's purpose is to lead you to another place to find another source, more information, and more evidence. Any time that a source does not provide you information that might lead you to another source, you need to think some more because every source leads you to another source. There used to be a saying somewhere that there were two records created for every event. There was a record created by the event itself, in other words, the person, the clerk. They created a record for themselves and they gave a copy of that record to the individual. So two records, one in personal possession, one in the possession of the government. I've always believed that because with the government, usually money changes hands, there's usually three records. There's the record for the individual, there's the record for the government, and there's the record for the treasury or the paymaster or the whoever's controlling the purser, whoever's controlling the money. So there might very well be three records that describe the same event. And I always try to find the three records that describe the same event, although it's very hard to find the personal records. 
usually I can find the government records. And I'm very fortunate as I figured out a long time ago how to find the treasury records. So we always have this balance of some people have said two, but they weren't thinking about the money. Follow the money. There's three. There's the personal copy, the government copy, and the treasury copy for most things. Not for all things, but for anything that has to do with money, there is. And lots of things have to do with money. So now that I've attempted to distract you sufficiently from the evidence analysis process map for the moment, let's go back and think for just a moment. What were the three things I just discussed? They were sources, information, and evidence. And tomorrow we will deal with what is a source. And then the next day we will deal with what is information. And then day after that, we will deal with what is evidence. There are classes of sources. There are classes of information. There are classes of evidence. And you can only do an appropriate analysis if you understand each one of these classes within each one of these. It, it, I, one of the things I'm trying to avoid is when someone uses the word indirect and they say, well, that's an indirect source. Well, that's not the case. It may be a primary source. It may be a derivative source. It may be an authored source, but it's not direct or indirect or negative. That's not what the source is. That's what the evidence is. Or they'll talk about primary sources. Well, there aren't primary sources. There are original sources that contain primary information. And there is not something called primary evidence. So this is the thing, this is my goal in the next few days is to try to fix it so that you understand what belongs with sources, what belongs with information, and what belongs with evidence so that you don't get confused. Or more importantly, you don't say something to someone that ad identifies you immediately as an individual who doesn't know what they're talking about. I hate for that to happen to me. So remember, if you hear somebody say, well, this is, this is a direct source or this is a primary source, they need to go back and look at the evidence analysis process map. So go get your evidence analysis process map, either in genealogical standards or in evidence explained, or if you happen to have a copy of it, the process map from somewhere else, just make sure that each one of them has three things under it and not two like this one. Now, another place that we could pull information from, although it's an older document, is the Historical Bi Biographer's Guide to the Research Process, which is a quick, quick sheet. Not to be confused with a quick start or a quick check, but a quick sheet. There's so much fun to be had in genealogy. This is Craig. This has been Just Genealogy. And today we've been talking about the high top level of the process map. We've been talking about sources, information, and evidence. And tomorrow we'll start to break those things down to make them much clearer to you as to what it all means. Have a good evening, have a good day, have a good morning, whatever time of day it is. Please subscribe. We're nearly at 400 people. I may take a day off if we have 400 people. No, I'll never take a day off. I'd have to be very sick. Fortunately, um, the guy in the warehouse that had COVID came back to work today and he's uh, had no untoward effects. So uh, I didn't get COVID. He got COVID and he's back to work. But... Um, He's kind of weak, so I sent him home early. 
So things are still hectic around the warehouse here at Heritage Books. A couple of new books came in. Can't wait to tell you about them on Sunday. Y'all have a good, what I, like I said, morning, afternoon, evening, day, night, whatever it is, wherever you are. Enjoy.